Martine scrambled to her feet, ignoring the hand Ben held out to her. You could have been a little more gentle with me, she said crossly. I apologize, said Ben, who seemed to be struggling not to laugh. I didn't recognize you until we were in midair, but you are trespassing, you know. What about you, Martine accuses, isn't this what you're doing? My father is a sailor, Ben pointed to one of the tall gray ships. That's his boat over there, the Aurora. I have permission to be here. You don't. Martine sighed. She could see that she had no choice but to tell Ben about Jimmy and just pray that he didn't try to stop her. As briefly and quickly as she could, she explained about her betrayal of the white giraffe, about the hunters, and about Grace's prediction. She also told them about her grandmother, parked behind the pines, waiting. Lastly, she told them as much Jemmy meant to her and how desperate she was to save him. Please, Ben, she said, please say you won't stand in my way. Ben's face was serious. For ages now, my father's word that the ship is being used to smuggle rare animals out of the country but he didn't want to notify the authorities until he was sure. If the giraffe is on board, I think we can get to him, but we must now go at once. The Aurora sets to sail in 30 minutes. Before Martine to get used to this new Ben, a Ben who spoke and smiled and was a million miles away from the shy, studious boy he appeared to be at school. He was striding confidently across the shipyard, beckoning for her to follow. He wore ragged jeans, heavy boots, and a sleeveless black t-shirt, and his arms, though thin, were, were strong. Martine ran to catch up with him. What do you think you're doing? She inquired breathlessly. Do you think, do you really imagine that we're just going to walk onto the ship and walk right out with a giraffe? We aren't, said Ben. You are, he smiled. Trust me. Sometimes the most obvious way is the best way. As if to prove him right, <coughs> the com a commotion erupted on the jetty. A crate had broken while being hoisted onto the deck in what looked like an antique table and several Several high-polished chairs were bobbling around the greasy green harbor. Men were cursing and shaking their fists, and two guard dogs were going berserk at the end of their chains. Ben took no notice of them. He strode coolly across the gangplank of the ship onto the deck and through a low doorway. Martine scuttled after him. Below deck, the ship was, was a worn of corridors, galleys, and anonymous cabins. They walked as quickly as they could among miles of battleship gray passages and down two spiral staircases, their footsteps ringing like church bells on the steel. Finally, they came to a storage room. A swarthy man was hunched over a computer. He jumped up when Ben tapped at the door and shouted something in a foreign language. Ben gave him a radiant smile. Captain Holloway is asking for you up on deck, he said politely. I'm not sure what it's about, but it seems to be urgent. The man glared at him suspiciously. He reached for his radio. I'm pretty sure it's an emergency, Ben said again. Muttering, the man snatched up some papers and scurried away along the corridor. Ben waited until he was out of sight and then darted into the room. Martine in here. He locked the door behind them and opened a filing cabinet. In it, hanging from brass hooks, were hundreds of keys. He began to sort through them methodically, laying them on the floor. Martine, te Martine checked her watch. It was just after midday. The boat sailed in 20 minutes. She dreaded to imagine the consequences if they hadn't found Jemmy by then. There was a knock at the door. Ben put his finger to his lips. The knock turned into hammering. Martine was a nervous wreck. Ben remained perfectly serene. He examined each key meticulously as if they had several spare hours up his sleeve, seeming unconcerned that he was particularly using an illegal animal rescue or raging Russian was now attacking the door with what sounded like a fire extinguisher. The pounding ceased and there was a steel echo of footsteps running away. Please, Martine panicked. Got it, said Ben, holding up a bunch of keys, but we don't have much time. He unlocked the door and the two of them shot across the passageway and down two more spiral staircases, darting into a supply closet when a couple of greasy stained engineers popped out the side door. Our team judged that they were now at the bottom of the ship. The air reeked with fumes. The floor shuddered and there was a low grinding roar of great engines coming to life. Do you think we're going to make it, whispered Martine? Ben didn't answer. They had reached an intersection of corridors and he was trying to decide which way to go. Oi, oi, said a thundered a voice. What have we here? Out of the gloom came a sun-reddened man in immaculate cut gray hair. He was marching towards him with a ferocious expression on his face. Good afternoon, sir, Ben called out cheerfully. The man's demeanor changed. Good heavens, Ben, he said. I didn't realize it was you. 
He looked at Martine and frowned. The two of you shouldn't really be down here, you know. This section is supposed to be off limits, and we're sailing in 15 minutes. So sorry, sir. I was showing my friend Martine around the ship, and I lost track of time. I must a bit. I'm also a bit lost. That's not like you, Ben, chuckled the man. You know this boat as well as your father does. If you take that passage to the cargo section, you'll find an elevator going up to the deck. Hurry now. You don't want to end up in, in Kazakhstan. Ha <laughs> ha. Ben thanked him profusely, and they ran off down the corridor. Soon they came to a large steel door. A red letter sign warned staff that they entered at their own risk and disclaimed any responsibility for injury, psychological trauma, or death caused by the biting, kicking, or venomous inhabitants within. Ben, ben pressed a key into Martine's hand. This is as far as I go. It's more than my father's job is worth to me to be caught down here. That's where you come out. Take the elevator up to level three and cross the gangplank. As soon as you're on the jetty, look left. You'll see a path leading up a hill to a pair of tall gates. I'll make sure that they're open. Martine hesitated. There was one more thing. Do you think you could try to get a message to my grandmother? Ben nodded. It's a promise. Good luck. You're on your own now. It took Martine five tries to find the right key. And all the while the ship creaked, seethed, and groaned like a wounded beast. Once or twice, Martine was convinced she felt the shift of its moorings. Finally, the lock clicked. She wrestled open the heavy steel door, feeling hopeful for the first time that day. As she entered, a nail caught her t-shirt sleeve and ripped a small hole in it. She pulled herself free, barely noticing it. As soon as the door it hissed shut behind her, the stench of oil, animals, manure, and seawater came at her in a sickly wave. She, she was in a cramped container area lit with flickering neon tubes. Scores of crated in boxes, how many draped with tarpaulins, were stacked in untidy rows in the shadows. Martine rushed over to those nearest to her and peered inside. There were glass cases full of withering snakes, cages crammed with crestfallen parrots, and boxes full of whimpering monkeys. A huddle of depressed sheep cowered in a crate that was plainly too small for them. The last container on the row housed an enormous blue-bottomed male baboon. And I'll make sure you see what that looks like in our comment section. When she lifted up the cover, the baboon lunged at the bars of his cage, yellow teeth bared. Martine almost jumped out of her skin. There was no sign of a giraffe. Martine had never felt more helpless in her life. Her heart ached for all these creatures that had been treated with less regard than a shipment of coal or rice. As if they had no feelings or needs, as if they were immune to thirst or hunger or impervious to pain. But she knew that there was no way on earth for her to save them all now. It looked increasingly unlikely that she could even find Jemmy. She tried to think logically. There were no obvious labels on the containers, but that didn't mean they weren't marked in some way. There had to be a system identifying them. She studied the boxes nearer to her. Each had a number scribbled on the lower right-hand side of the door. A twinge on her upper arm reminded her that the nail that had torn her sleeve. Something had been swinging from it, some sort of notebook. Seconds later, she had it. Number 144, Giraffe, Isle C. She saw number 144 right away, and if she'd, she'd been thinking more clearly, she probably would have spotted it sooner. The black painted container higher and whiter than the rest. She dashed over to it and whipped the tarpaulin aside. Jimmy was lying on the floor, his legs at odd angles. His white and silver coat was covered in cuts and matted in blood. He seemed to be dead. Jemmy, sobbed Martine. Oh, Jemmy, why have I done, what have I done to you? Jemmy raised his head at the sound of her voice. His eyes were full, dull and empty. Martine fell on her knees beside the container. Jemmy, please don't die. I love you so much. The white giraffe flopped down again and his eyelids drooped. His breathing was shallow. Martine slid back the bolts on the cage door and knelt down beside him. She be, he, she began to stroke his face and his neck, feeling again now that familiar tingle. Please wake up, Jemmy, please. There was no response. Martine closed her eyes and put her hands on the white giraffe's heart. Unbidden, technical memories of their time together came flooding into her mind. Of the evening she first saw him standing in the storm, shimmering against the night sky. Of the unforgettable moment when he rested his head on her shoulder of lying on his back high up in the encartsment, staring at the Milky Way. Of course, their exhilarating rides among the hippos, elephants, and lions of Sabwana. 
Through it all, Martine was aware of her hands becoming hotter and hotter and the pure feeling like love flowing through her. A huge shudder went into Jemmy's body. He gave a great gasping breath, and as if trying to reclaim the life that had nearly been taken from him, his eyes opened at the same time as Martine's, and the light came back into them. And Martine knew that that moment he still loved her and still had faith in her. Martine pressed her face up against his velvet shoulder and gave him a kiss. She sat up, fingers trembling. She fumbled in the, por in the pouch for one of the bottles that Grace had given her on the night they had met in the cave. For bleeding or numb in any pain, she instructed. Privately, Martine had to resolve never to use it. It was the most alarming color, and the smell of it, somewhere between minced up frogs and Brussels sprouts, made her want to vomit. But right now, she had very few options. She knew she had the power to heal, but she wasn't sure how much gift she could do. She gotten the impression from what had happened with the kudu that she still needed the help of traditional medicine in certain situations. Martine didn't know how badly in, injured Jemmy was, or even if he was capable of walking, but she did know that they had no chance of getting out of the shipyard unless he could gallop. She removed the cork from the bottle and, holding her nose with one hand, bobbed the mixture into his cuts with the other. It sizzled on application. The ship gave a lurch that almost sent her flying. She held up her watch to the light, only six minutes till it sailed. Martine was frantic. The mixture would have to work its magic along the way. She stroked the white giraffe urgently. Jemmy, she said, we have to go. After what seemed like an eternity, he lumbered to his feet and stood there swaying. Martine started for the door and breathed a sigh of thanks when he followed her, stumbling a little. They were almost at the exit when a glint of gold and black caught Martine's eye. Oh, leopard cubs. Martine was pretty sure that they too had been stolen from Samoana. They could even be the cubs whose, whose poor Tende had shown, a, shown her at the encarcement. But even if they were there, there was no way she could help them now. They were lying in a heap in the corner of their cage, clearly drugged. With a last anguished look at the cubs, Martine guided Jemmy through the steel door into the cargo elevator. It was three times as the width and the depth of a normal elevator, but the giraffe still had to bend his neck. He snorted with alarm. Martine pressed the button for level three, and the elevator began to rise. She realized then that she hadn't thought past this point of rescuing him. With Martine on foot and the white giraffe running fear crazed around the dockyard, pursued no doubt by men with guns, disaster would quickly follow. She would have to ride him. Jimmy was quaking in the, in the clattering, catastrophic elevator, but soon stood quiet when she indicated that she was going to try to mount him. Using the support rail as a foothold and doing everything she could to avoid touching any of the cuts on his necks or shoulders, neck or shoulders, Martine scrambled onto his back just as the elevator shuddered to a halt. One minute to go. The doors opened. Alex Dupreeze was standing in front of them, talking on his cell phone. In the end, it was much easier than he thought, he said, like taking candy from a baby. He saw Martine and Jemmy at the same moment they saw him. His face went the color of a frozen turkey. He dropped his phone and whirled around. Raised the gangplank, he roared. Stop them. Run, Jemmy, screamed Martine. But the white giraffe was already in full flight. He swept across the deck, striking Alex a glancing blow with his hoof as he went. Alex dropped like a stone. There was a loud grinding noise and the gangplank began to rise. On the jetty, men were shouting and pointing and tearing across the dockyard from all directions. The ship began to move. Martine's heart was ready to burst out of her chest. But Jemmy never hesitated. He galloped up to the gangplank as it rose and took a flying leap. Martine looked down. There was nothing below them but ocean.